Well, good afternoon, brethren. It's good to see all of you today. Happy Sabbath to all of you. My uh, eyes were getting a little weepy back there as Dave went through his sermonette. I'm just always in awe as how uh, God puts all this together. It just, if you've ever spoke, you know exactly what I'm talking about because God leads it as it should be. What is the greatest opportunity that any of you can imagine? What is the greatest thing that could happen in your life that you can imagine? For most of you, you would say the kingdom. And that's what I want to focus on. God's coming kingdom. I'm going to go through several scriptures, and some of these you may just want to write down because I've got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, just to make sure we have enough time. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, In my Father's house, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Man. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. Christ said he'll prepare a place for us. A position in his coming kingdom. He likened the kingdom unto hidden treasure. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 43 through 50, our Savior said again, The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hides. And for joy thereof, he goes and sells all that he has. And he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. You notice the similarities here. Gave all. Gave all for that one thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the age. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wheel, uh, excuse me, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Just like these parables God instructed us in Matthew 6, verse 24, He said, For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Just like these parables, we have to give all. We either serve God or we serve ourselves. The carnal side wants to serve itself. It's self-serving, it's self-pleasing. It looks only to the self. When we look to God and we're following God's lead of His Holy Spirit, we look to others. This is part of what the sermon that was on. There are two parts of our relationship with God that I want to focus on. Two vital keys. And if you're looking for a title for this sermon, I would call it two vital keys. The first vital key for us to be in God's kingdom is to never lose the fear of God. If we lose the fear of God, we're going to lose sight of God's Word, of God's will. So Mr. Zavine has talked about God's will in the sermonette today. In Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus Christ said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the spirit, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
See, God can never, we can be destroyed and never resurrected to life again. It's permanent. Those that have been called, baptized, had land, hands laid upon them and received God's Holy Spirit, judgment is at that house. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord, and you are the part of the house of the Lord. And judgment is on us now. Through the rest of our lifetime, we are being judged. And we have things to overcome. We have a carnal nature to overcome. And we have to strive, as it was brought up in the sermon at, we have to strive to overcome that carnal nature. And God knows our hearts. And if we're trying, God knows, and he'll be patient and merciful with us. But if our heart is not right, we'll fall into condemnation. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 13 through 16. The fear of the eternal is to hate evil. God's people can relate to this. We hate evil in arrogancy, in the evil way, in the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. He goes on to say, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early She'll find me. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the eternal, men depart from evil. By the fear of the eternal, men depart from evil. If we have the proper fear of God Almighty, we will depart from evil. We will constantly strive and be working toward perfection. We're called to work towards perfection. Become ye perfect. There's no magic. There's no magic with God in anything. You have to work at it. Proverbs 14.27 says, The fear of the eternal is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So the fear of God related to life, you depart from the snares of death. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 17 says to let not thine heart envy sinners. Don't envy the sinful way, the sinful nature, or people that are sinners. But be you in the fear of the eternal all day long. Constant. You know, we look back, we look back to Israel, that nation that was enslaved for 430 years, and on the same self-same day, they came out by a mighty hand. For over a year, God worked through Moses and Aaron, performing countless miracles before their eyes, before all of Egypt's eyes. Ten plagues put upon them. The waters become blood, frogs, lice, flies. Livestock diseased, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and finally, ultimately, the death of the firstborn of every household that did not have the blood upon the, the doorpost and the lintels. <clears throat> They've seen countless miracles. But see, in the sermonette, there was a key I was looking for it that David brought up. In Deuteronomy 30, their heart turned away. I only call the verse. I didn't have a chance to go back and write it down. But their heart turned away. These people seen God <laughs> do countless things. He went before them in a, at a cloud by day and fire by night. He fed them bread, manna from heaven. We've never seen anything like that. We've never witnessed that. Of course, what we have is God's Holy Spirit. But they've seen the physical. 
He divided the Red Sea for them to escape from Pharaoh's army. Constantly protected them, fed them, gave them water from a rock. They murmured. You can go back and read. They murmured against him. He brought us out here to die. Where's the fear in that? Where's the fear in that kind of attitude? They did not trust God to lead them into the promised land. They were afraid. Focused on the physical, I may lose my life. Again, back to the self. The enemy looks too strong. What's our enemy? Sin. Satan, the devil. God protects us from Satan. He could destroy us. God protects us. As long as we're following his will, he will continue to protect us. He'll put a hedge about us and protect us spiritually. <clears throat> they were afraid of the enemy, and they were afraid of losing their lives. So God told them, you'll wander in the wilderness for 40 years. This generation will pass. You will not see the promised land. And they didn't. Let's turn uh, to Deuteronomy for a moment. Chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we'll start uh, in verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe and do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Eternal swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what thou would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the eternal does man live. And we have another witness to that in Matthew chapter 4. It says that man is to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee. Here's another miracle. Neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the eternal thy God chastens you. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the eternal thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Walk in his ways and fear him. For the eternal thy God brings thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths and spring of valleys and hills. And for us, we could read into Revelation, the kingdom that's going to come to this earth and the beauty of it. And we could liken that as this physical promised land that they were to receive, we were to receive God's kingdom. We are to be a part of it. And we are to inherit. Join heirs. Join heirs, the scriptures say, with Christ. That, you just can't imagine that. We don't deserve that. It's only through Christ's blood. A join heir. When you have eaten and are full, and shall bless the eternal thy God for the good land which he has given you, beware that thou forget not the eternal thy God, in keeping not his commandments and judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full, and has built goodly houses and dwelt therein. Now these are things that can happen to us, brethren, while we're waiting for that kingdom to come. These are things that we can get caught up into the physical. We have constantly have to be focused on the spiritual. If we get thinking about material things and get caught up into the world, which the enemy caught up into other things. Whatever it is, whatever takes your time away from time that we should be spending with God, whether it be in meditation or prayer, <clears throat> we can't get caught up in these things. They'll destroy us. 
Again, I'll read verse 12. Lest when you have eaten and are full, and you have goodly houses, and dwell therein, and when your herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up. That's a carnal nature. And it can happen. It can happen to people with God's Spirit if you let it. Your heart be lifted up, and thou forget the eternal thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and out from the house of bondage. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. If we at any time in our lives allow ourselves to get off track, and it happens, but if we don't get back on track, if we become focused, on the self, we're in grave trouble. Our salvation very well may depend upon it. The second, excuse me, the second key that's vital to our entering into God's kingdom, our overcoming, is a love of the truth. Sometimes I have a hard time with this. So I know I spoke a couple of years ago in uh, New Orleans, the feast, about when my wife and I went through our calling, and I talked about some of that. What a special, special time it was. And I think you can each reflect back because all of our cases are are different, and God dealt with us all in a different way. But I'm a hard-headed person. I probably don't know that, but never seen that, but I'm a little stubborn. And, uh, you know, we were studying nightly, I mean hours. I'd sit up till 2, 3 in the morning because I was confronted with the truth. I was confronted with it, and I had to prove it. Is it right or is it wrong? We were part of a Pentecostal church. I had a brother-in-law that, you know, kept God's truth, and I thought he was a little mental. I liked the guy, but I thought he was a little off track. So I had to prove it. I had to prove it. In fact, one night he really agitated me because I thought I had him. I had a little get together and I had whipped up my Bible to Colossians and I said, read this. And he's reading it says, uh, let no man judge you in uh, meat or drink in Colossians. I don't remember the whole verse, but the point was let no man judge you. And I'm thinking, you know, the Sabbath and Sunday's okay and all this and that. And he read it. He goes, yep. And he slid that Bible back over to me. He said, that's right. My jaw's about to say, what do you mean that's right? I got gotcha. you. He says, yeah, let no man judge you. God is our judge. Oh, I drove home. I was upset. Blood was boiling. So for three weeks, I'm studying night and day. My mother-in-law can tell you I smoked back then. I'm sitting at her table one night. We're over there. I'm up till 1, 2 in the morning smoking cigarettes, reading my Bible. But uh, I came to a point that all the Bibles were going to be thrown away in my house because I was confused and I didn't understand. And it made absolutely no sense. I would think I'd find a scripture that said, yeah, you need to do this or that with regard to God's commandments. And I'd find something else that would throw me the other way. And I was just, came to a point that I was done. Mentally, I was exhausted. And I thought, I'm going to pray one last time. And I said, Lord, if you'll show me, I will do it. And I opened my Bible. It was a NIV. I still have it at home. And I have it marked very well. I opened my Bible. It opened up to Ezekiel 20.20. 20. And it said, hallow my Sabbath. And then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. And that night, my eyes were open. I didn't understand everything. But I'll tell you what, I was afraid to go to bed. I stayed up till about 3 in the morning, 
going through those scriptures, highlighting my Bible in all kinds of places. In fact, I still have that Bible at home and I have several little pieces of paper. I was tearing them off and putting them in because now I could see. The blinders were taken off. And it just kept coming. And then Sandy, she was over at her mom and dad's because her dad was had cancer and we're talking on the phone and she's starting to see the same things I am. And it's like, the miracle taking place here. But what a special time. And you each have your own story and how special it was when God showed you. The Sabbath, I think, is a catalyst for all of us. And we have to remember that. We have to remember the special things that God has done in each and every one of our lives. <clears throat> the other thing I remember that night is I knew, see, I was raised, I always believed there was a God. You know, I was raised in different churches and whatever, and I was taught that there is a Creator. And of course, I've always been in awe to God's creation, always. And uh, that night, though, was different. Because that night, I knew there was a God. And what an awesome time it is to come out of all the falsehood, all the lies that you've been brought up. You remember being children and being taught that there's a Santa Claus and all these things, Easter bunnies. And you find out that it's all false. It's all false. And of course, as adults, we know there isn't. But why do we lie? Why do people lie to their kids? I remember lying to my kids. I went around for about three weeks, and I was just really in a lot of shock to all the deception I had been brought up to believe all my life. And uh, my wife and I were very serious. We stayed away from any type of church for a long time. We did get some of the booklets from Mr. Armstrong and whatnot, but we studied on our own. We wanted to just... It was like, after all this deception, we don't want to be asking all different kinds of advice. We want to just study and see what the scriptures say. I remember Sandy seen the holy days before I did. It was Sabbath, plural. She goes, that's got to be the holy days. And I was like, but anyway, I better get on here or we'll, we'll be out of time. So a love of the truth. We have to hold on to a love of this truth that God has given to us. In the book of Thessalonians, the second book, chapter 2, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. And we'll start uh, in verse 8. And then shall that uh, wicked be revealed. Yeah, I'm in the right one. All right. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. This talking about Christ's return. And even him whose uh, coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying, wo and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not a love of the truth. Here talking about some in the church that receive not a love of the truth. They've seen some things, they went along for a time, you know, maybe they came to Sabbath services every week, but they didn't really have a love of the truth. It never really took root. That they might, okay, a love of the truth that they might be saved. See, there's the other side of that. You have that love of the truth that you might be saved. You've got to have that. You need it to get through each day. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the eternal, or of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. Sanctification. Separate. God separated us. He's called you and given you His Spirit into the belief of the truth. Whereunto He called you by our good news to the obtaining of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have uh, been taught, not even our Father, which in, in good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, in every good word and work. In John 14, 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth, you've seen him, and you know him. So Christ, the Logos, the spokesman, the Word that became flesh, is the way, the truth, and the life. And I know Mr. Chapman, Chapman has given several messages on that, about the truth, and what is the truth. And if you haven't heard them, you need to. But Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 